All right, now. Got a little bit of family affair with Mary J. Blige. And if y'all notice, I haven't played Mary J. in a while, so I apologize for that. Let's get it funky. I apologize, ladies and gentlemen. I'm going to let her do it. You got to dance for me. Haters, I love me. And so we must get it percolating. While you're waiting, so just dance for me. Come on, everybody, get on now. There you go, Mary. Cause you know we got to get it wrong. Mary J is in the spot tonight, and I'm going to make it. I'm going to turn the music off because the conversation I'm about to have, I cannot have that type of music playing. Because she's talking about funkin' in the spot. Come on, everybody, get on now. Cause you know we got to get it wrong. Mary J is in the spot tonight, and I'm going to make it. Yeah, yeah, no, she's talking about getting funky. Anyway, that's Mary J. Blige. We'll get back to Mary J. another day. Got something I want to talk to you guys about. From time to time, I'll do a video and somebody will send me, like you hear the chime right there. They'll send me text messages, emails, and stuff like that, even though I tell them don't do it. Tell them y'all ain't supposed to be doing that. Y'all gonna run into some problems y'all do something like that with me because I don't play that. I say don't do it, and you do it anyway, and you do it on my platform, you do it with my stuff, then we got a problem, ladies and gentlemen, and I can't just sit back and allow that to go on, but I let some people do it because I feel for him. There's a youngster. He's a youngster. To me, he's a youngster because I am 30 years older than he is, and he just had a child with a significant other. And so he texted me a video. Because I, I talked about the, the so-called King James Version of Firmament. Firmament. Because they put that in the King James Version and people, Lord have mercy. They literally have taken the word and used today's definition for firmament. And not the 16th century definition. Don't the, I, 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 hold on now. These are the intelligent people who understand scripture, who understand time periods, who understand meaning of words and changings of meaning of words, especially English words, because English is a language that is the most stupidest language in the entire world. I said stupidest. That's right, stupidest word language group in the entire world. Why? Because English, they'll make a word out of anything. Pay attention. Anything. Did you hear what I just said? Anything. Somebody just took two words and put them together and they created a word. Thus, a compound word. Okay? You've heard of the five, six, 18 syllable words that they make in America? Look, super fragile, super fragile, see, I can't even say it now. Super fragile, fragile, delicious, that's not a word. Super fragile, fragile, let's see, SPL doses. That's not a word. I'm sorry. Cycle alpha, disco beta, bio, I could do. That's not a word, people. Those are not words. Those are a bunch of words put together. And somebody said, look, I created a new word. Please. So that's English. <sighs> I digress. So let's do a little experiment. Now, I haven't done this before. I, I did it with something else, but I haven't done it like this, so y'all bear with me, okay? We're going to talk to Bard. We're going to see what this idiot, I mean, Bard has to say about this. Watch this. Wake up. Wake up. I have a question. Comma. In the King James Version of the Bible, of 1611, the word firmament is utilized in the first chapter respecting the waters and the separation of the waters. Comma. I need to know what was the definition of firmament of 1611 CE? Question mark. Stop listening.
Ladies and gentlemen, common error is what CE stands for. A lot of people think it stands for Christ's execution, and it doesn't. But now, he says the word firmament appears in Genesis 1-7. We're going to let him tell it. I ain't no need of me uh, giving it to you guys. He's got to be careful because he's the one that offend those flat earthers. But let's let's talk. In the King James Version, KJV, of the Bible published in 1611, the word, firmament, appears in Genesis chapter 1 verse 7, where it describes the creation of a division between the, waters above, and the, waters below. However, the meaning of, firmament, in 1611 CE was slightly different from its modern usage. Here's a breakdown of the meaning. Modern usage. Firmament, today often refers to the vast expanse of space, the sky, or the celestial sphere. It can also imply a sense of solidity, like a dome or vault. 1611 CE Usage The word comes from the Latin, firmamentum, which means, something made firm or solid. However, in the context of the KJV, firmament, primarily translates the Hebrew word, rakia, which means, expansion, or, expanse. The KJV translators believed, firmament, more accurately conveyed the idea of a vast, extended space rather than a solid dome. Hold on now. Hey, I told you I've never asked this question of it before. But I've known this since I was 15 years old when I did the research myself. I did the research. We didn't have internet where we could go onto a computer and have it do the research for us. No, I had to go through books and look for this. Now, I, I know this because I know the King James Version is written in what we refer to as Old English and that the meaning of words have changed since then. So for those of you who believe that common ordinary meaning of the word meaning solidity or a dome or a vault let me share something with you and i'm not being cynical here i'm being from the standpoint of somebody who doesn't understand the concept of people believing that the earth could be flat when we look at a lunar eclipse or a solar eclipse we see the shape of the planet earth that there are no other flat planets in the known universe we have not even seen a single picture of a flat planet anywhere lord have mercy sorry this was updated today and so it's going to take a second let me pause y'all for a second while it's doing that y'all pardon me what happens is i set it to update a month ago and i never checked it again and it never updated like it was supposed to so now i got two gigabytes <laughs> To download so we're gonna hide that from now and we're gonna go here now remember it used the word expanse now I want you guys to understand there are a lot of people who talk about Jehovah's Witnesses how they so-called created their own Bible made their own Bible please Lord have mercy the only thing Jehovah's Witnesses did was authorize the placing of God's name back in the Bible which they couldn't authorize it even if they wanted to God's name appeared in the Bible over 7,000 times, and King James took it out. All 7,000, what is it? 7,000, I, I forgot, I think it's 7,200 times it appears in there, 7,122 times, whatever. They only left it in there four times, plus two additional times where it's in addition to another word, Jehovah Jireh and Jehovah Nisi. Anyway, let's look at verse number seven. Then God went on to make the expanse and divide the waters beneath and the expanse from the waters above the expanse at, 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 and it was so. God called the expanse heavens, the sky, and there was evening and there was morning a second day. Ladies and gentlemen, it never meant a dome. It never meant he created a dome. How? What? What? Think about it. What is that? What sense does that make? He created a dome. That he didn't need to create the rest of the universe. Didn't need to create Jupiter, Mars, Venus, Saturn. He didn't need to create none of those planets. The moon? Why would there be a necessity for the moon? That makes no sense. But you have these people who have these interesting beliefs that we're in a simulation. Ladies and gentlemen, the Earth isn't flat. There is no proof that the earth is flat. There's just individuals who simply say that it's flat. 
They don't provide any evidence that it's flat. But we don't have spaceships, so we can't go up there and prove it. And they've only provided us pictures, and so they're lying to us. Ladies, gentlemen, many of you have been to India. Many of you have been to China. Look at the population in India and China and tell me that this is a flat earth because that would mean we have limited land and we don't have limited land. Y'all need to pay attention to how much land we actually have. Take a plane trip across the midsection of the United States and look at all the land that is uninhabited that's just sitting there waiting for somebody to say, I own you, okay? China is the same way. There is tons of land on this planet where nobody lives that is arable land that you can grow things on, but nobody lives there because the governments don't do any infrastructure in those areas. <sighs> Wusa. Now let's get back to the Earth. Ladies and gentlemen, it's not necessary to look for the words sphere or circle in order to document that the earth is not flat. That's not necessary. <coughs> We're, everybody, the young lady, he sent a video of a young lady on TikTok and she's referring to the earth in the book of Isaiah. And she's saying when Isaiah spoke of it, it meant this and no, it meant that, blah, blah, blah. So let me, let's do the Isaiah thing, if y'all don't mind, just, just for a second. We'll go to Isaiah. Oh, let's do, no, before we go to Isaiah, we did firmament. That's verse number seven. Genesis, the first chapter, verse number seven. I apologize. Let, let's go to Rotherham. Because we already know the King James Version uses the word firmament. So we're going to go to Rotherham. Rotherham's emphasized Bible. And we're going to go to verse number seven. Seven. And God made the expanse and... It divided between the waters that were under the expanse and the waters that were above the expanse, and it was so. And so God called the expanse heavens, and so it was evening, and it was morning the second day. Rotherham! Rotherham, well, he got the same word. Let's go to the American Standard Version. Uh, I used to use this Bible all the time because it actually had God's name in it a little bit more times than the King James Version, so I chose to use it. Uh, but this, ladies and gentlemen, is, now this one uses the word fir firmament. So God called the firmament heaven, the firmament, and divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters that were above the firmament. And God called the firmament. So let's do this. We're going to take this word. Now we went to chat GPT, okay? I mean chat GPT, we went to Bard. So let's go to perplexity because I'm interested to see if somebody else has the definition. So give me one second. We're going to copy and we're going to go to perplexity. Now I got to see, I got to open up a new perplexity window. So y'all excuse me for a second while I get perplexity to open up. Now I know not everybody's interested in this because this ain't a concern about everybody, but you guys, you need to understand there are a lot of people on this planet who believe in this thing called a flat earth. Now I say this thing called a flat earth. There's never been any proof with an F, 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 F of a flat earth. It's not letting me get into perplexity, y'all. It's saying, oh no, you ain't going there. It's supposed to give me a little window here to click on. Oh, you know what? The last time I know what it is, it, it did it delayed the last time. So give me a second. We're gonna go to a chat GPT too. Oh, come on, I'm already logged in. Why you do that? Give me a second to log into this piece of junk. I apologize, ladies and gentlemen. I was logged in. It knew I was logged in, but it decided it wanted to be stupid. So, one second. Hmm, that was a carry forward tax credit one, huh? Oh, well. Get out of here. Nobody wants y'all sitting up here trying to get people to sign up and so you could track them. No, you ain't tracking. Oh, sorry, ladies and gentlemen. I apologize. Now, we're going to let that one go. Perplexity gave us an answer. And we're going to let this one go. Now, remember, they used... Oh, sorry. 
The American Standard Version is literally a translation of the King James Version. They didn't actually translate from the original scriptures. They literally almost copied word for word the King James Version, with the exception of adding God's name back to the scriptures. Hold on now. I just asked ChatGPT. Now, he can talk. I'm going to let him talk. In the King James Version of the Bible from 1611, the term firmament is used in Genesis 1,6-8 to describe the expanse or the vault of the sky created by God to separate the waters below from the waters above. The term firmament in this context refers to the celestial sphere or the sky, often understood as a solid and stable structure. It was a concept prevalent in the cosmology of the time, reflecting the understanding of the heavens as a tangible and structured element in the natural world. Now, that was confusing. Because notice what it says, a celestial sphere or the sky, often understood as a solid and stable structure. And I'm, I got to do this. Does not make, that does not make sense. Mother, I'm um, sorry. So hold on. I apologize <sighs> if my previous response was unclear. In the King James Version of the Bible from 1611, the term firmament refers to the expanse or vault of the sky now created by God to separate the waters below from the waters above, as described in Genesis 1 colon 6 8. Now The term suggests a solid and structured celestial sphere or sky, reflecting the cosmological beliefs of that era. Wait, how did he... Wait, uh-uh. Ladies and gentlemen, how did he know exactly the concept is more prominent with pre-scientific times and was generally replaced by astronomical observations and evolving scientific understanding, modern blah, blah, blah. How did he know that that's what I was reading? See? Emphasize blah, blah, blah. How did they, how did he know that that's what I was reading? Hold on. Watch if you this. have further questions or need additional clarification, no for you. feel free to ask. Sitting up here piggybacking on my, sitting up here, he's copying me now. Now I'm just going to take the same thing and put it here. I appreciate your clarification and apologize for any confusion in my previous responses. If you have any more questions or if there's anything specific <laughs> you'd like to explore further regarding the King James Version or oh, any God. other topic, please feel free to ask. Okay. I'm here to assist you. Would you shut up? Oh, by the way, this right here, I want y'all to pay attention. This right here, and we're going to go to this in a second. This right here is ChatGPT. So the word firmament in the King James Version of the Bible of 1611 refers to an expanse or vault over the earth, sky, atmosphere is what they're saying. It denotes the space or expanse like an arc appearing immediately above us, the sky, and it does not convey the, does not convey the sense of solidity, but of stretching or an expansion where the atmosphere, like I said, clouds or stars appear to be in place and are really seen. Anyway, the Hebrew word for firmament is rakia, which properly means an expanse or the firmament or apparently visible arc of the sky, as you see in a lot of photos of the earth, and is considered by Hebrews as solid and supporting waters above, because there was waters above. Therefore, in the context of the King James Version, the 16 firmament refers to the expanse above the earth, Genesis 1, 6 through 8, and it is not conveyed, uh, not used to convey the more scientific understanding of the term. Thank you. Now, that's not what I asked for, so let's go here, because this says definition. Oh, I, I had no idea what they were going to say. Stop listening. I did not know, ladies and gentlemen. No wonder. Let me pause y'all. I'll explain in a second.
Before we read, what does it mean, ladies and gentlemen? The reason why I said I'll explain in a second, because that's why ChatGPT was listening to what was being said when it provided its answer, because it was listening. So as you can see, it's typing up everything I was saying. So I apologize to y'all for that, how stupid this system is. Now, firmament, firmament, get out of here. No, as a matter of fact, you stay there. Oh, it won't let me do anything else because it's, yeah, ah, one more second, y'all. It ain't letting me. Okay, that wasn't fun. All right, firm a mint. Firm a nintium from firmus or firm fimo. The region of the air, the sky, or heavens. The in scripture, the word denotes an expanse, a wide extent for such a significant of the Hebrew word coinciding with regio, region, or reach. The original, therefore, does not convey the sense of solidity, but of stretching or extension, the great arc or expanse over our heads, in which are placed the atmosphere of the clouds, in which the stars appear to be in place and are really seen. This is where Bard, not Bard, but uh, what's her face? Uh, Chat GPT and Perplexity got their definition from. Ladies and gentlemen, the reason why the sky or atmosphere was necessary is because there was no atmosphere at the beginning. Oh, I'm sorry. Let me see if I can better explain this, and then some of you guys will get it. Some of you, not all of you. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Billions of years transpired from verse 1 to verse 2. Because remember, by the time he starts with the earth, the sun and the moon are already there. Okay. Then it says, and the earth was waste and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. And God said, hey, let there be light. And there was light. Ladies and gentlemen. The light was already there. It's just that it hadn't shown through on the earth because of all the gases and the mixes. and the, That's what scientists have already told you all about. There was no way for light to shine through because the atmosphere was so thick with pollutants and particles and everything that the sun could not get through. So he had to clear the sky. Okay? That's simple. Then it says he called that the light day in the darkness he called night and there was evening and there was morning the first day prior to that it was all night there was no light it was all night okay got it good now pay attention verse number six the second day and god said let there be a firmament or should we use a better word an atmosphere layers of atmosphere we have the ozone layer Shh, don't tell nobody Okay, ladies and gentlemen, that's all he did was create layers of an atmosphere. And before he did this, hold on, got this, we, we got to go there. Uh-oh, I went to the wrong way. Uh-uh, went the wrong way. We got to go, come on now, work with me. Ladies and gentlemen, before this situation where he says to Noah, the end of all flesh has come before me, for the earth is filled with violence. Hmm. I wonder where we've seen that before. Through them. And behold, I will destroy them and the earth. Why? Because God saw the earth, and behold, it was corrupt, and all flesh in the earth was corrupt in their ways upon the earth. So he had to get rid of the corruption. It's like a cyst or a boil. You got to get rid of it. You cut that junk right on out. And that's what he did. So do you know what he did? Hold on. We're going to go a little bit further. 
In the 600th year of Noah's life, he was closer to perfection, he lived longer. In the second month, on the 17th day of the month, on the same day were all the fountains of the great deep broken open and the windows of heaven were opened. And the rain was upon the earth 40 days and 40 nights. Now, let me show you, this is Genesis, the sixth chapter, verse 11. Let me show you how other versions list that so that you guys can see. Because remember, they're getting this from the Bible, so they're going to have to go according to what the Bible says. Rotherham. Rotherham. And we're going to go, Genesis. And we're going to go 6. And we're going to go 11. 7 11, no, 6 11. And the earth was corrupt before God. Oh, no, we have to go to 7 11. I'm sorry. That, we were at 7 11. We weren't at 6 11. All right. In the 600th year, in the year of the life of Noah, in the second month of the 17th day of the month, on this day were burst open all of the fountains of the great roaring deep, and the waters of the heavens were set open. Hmm. And it came to pass that a heavy, that heavy rain was on the earth, 40 days and 40 nights. Hmm. Let's see if we can get another understanding. We're not going to go there, or let's do this one. I haven't done this one yet. Let's do this one. Because the person told people to go back and read for themselves. Oh, I, I should be doing number seven instead of just stopping at six. All right, now we're going to go to verse 11. Let's see. In the 600 year of Noah's life, in the second month, on the 17th day of the month, on this day, all the water holes leading from the great deep split wide and hatched of the sky were open. Hatches of the sky, excuse me. And there was rain on the earth 40 days and 40 nights. Well, see, originally it wasn't rain. Originally it was a flood of water because that's several miles high, that water coming down. Why do you think we have things like the Grand Canyon? Why do you think we have these valleys that are so deep? Because that's how much force that water hit. Now, let's take one more trip. If y'all don't mind, those of y'all who are still here, because I know we done lost half of the class, we're going to go to this one. And we're going to go Genesis, Genesis. Genesis, 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 Genesis. And we're going to go to verse number 11. In the 600 year of Noah's life, in the second month, on the 17th day of the month, on that day, all the springs of the vast watery deep burst open and the floodgates. That's right. It was being held up by technically gates. That was the so-called firmament or the expanse of the heavens were open and rain poured down upon the earth. See, poured down, not just rained down makes it seem like it's a drizzle on the earth 40 days and 40 nights okay this is what was going on it was not anything other than the waters were being held above see here's the thing the people who talk about the firmament they cannot talk about it with any other sense because now they'd have to ignore the flood because I, I asked one person, where did the water go? Ladies and gentlemen, all of that water, where did it go? If the earth is flat, where did all the water go? You, you need to understand, because if they believe the earth was flat and all of that water was put above, and we know how many metric tons of water there is on this planet, where did all the water go? Oh no, you guys don't understand. Okay, with a flat earth, where does the water go when it reaches the edge? Because that means there is an edge. Then the person made comments on, hold on, give me one second. I, I know several scriptures that say it, but I want to find it in its earliest inference. So we're going to do F-O-U-R. Of the E-A-R-T-H. The person mentioned the phrase, the four corners of the earth, 
And when they mentioned the phrase, the four corners of the earth, they were pulling it from Isaiah. I know it's in Revelation, okay? Because it talks about them holding back the four winds. But let's pay attention to Isaiah, the 11th chapter. And we're going to look at verse number 11. In that day, Jehovah will again offer his hand a second time to reclaim the remnant of his people who were left from Assyria, from Egypt, and from Patos, and from Cush, from Elam, from Sinar, from Hamath, and from the islands of the sea. He will raise up a signal for the nations and gather the dispersed ones of Israel, not fleshly Israel people. This is not that Jerusalem thing you guys know, because remember, <laughs> Israel is not in Jerusalem. Pay attention. The Israel today is not in Jerusalem. But shh, don't tell nobody. Let's continue. And he will gather together the scattered ones of Judah from the four corners of the earth. So let's do this. I don't want to go there because that's going to tell us what is meant by the four corners. So watch this. Copy. I want to go and get an independent moronic view. So we're going to go to Bard. And we're going to ask Bard, W-H-A-T-B-O-E-S-T-H-I-S-M-E-A-N, colon, space, paste, question mark. And let's see what he says. From the four corners of the earth is a figurative expression that has several possible interpretations depending on the context. Here's the most common ones from all over the world. Four corners of the earth. It's figurative. It's not literal. Well, that means the earth is flat because he said corners. Really? The other definition it could mean is from every direction, from every extreme and furthest reaches. And then it's hyperbolic expression. In other words, it's a hyperbole. From the four corners of the earth can be used to hyperbically, uh, use hyperbolically, meaning it's an exaggeration that emphasizes the importance or significance of something. So, ladies and gentlemen, watch what I do now. We we gotten all of those different definition of what four corners of the earth mean, because this is what the person was using, and I wrote back to the person who sent it to me that that person needs to. If he's going to get information, get something from somebody who knows what the scriptures say. Give me one second. Close quote. A C C O R D I N G to I S A S I. No, I can't do that. I A H. Isaiah, the uno uno, colon. Uno, uno. Uh-oh, how did I lose that? Give me back my colon. Colon. Nope, I need that colon. Okay, uno, uno. All right, now let's see what he means now. Tick-tock, 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 tick-tock. The phrase four corners of the earth in Isaiah 11, 11, I'm going to let it I'm going to let it play. Don't, don't need to me reading it. I'm tired of reading anyway today. Hurry up, Bart. I ain't got all day. We got to let these people the go The phrase, back. from the four corners of the earth, in Isaiah chapter 11 verse 11 is a rich and multifaceted poetic expression with several possible interpretations, depending on your theological perspective and understanding of the prophecy. Hold Here on. Hold on. I got to correct them. Sorry, ladies and gentlemen, give me one second. According to the context, and I want you to ignore political correctness and give me the precise meaning according to the context of that particular book of the Bible in conjunction with the other books of the Bible, comma, the book of Acts and the book of Revelation. Exclamation mark.
Stop listening. Ladies and gentlemen, he was being politically correct. That's why he says, depending on your interpretation, the Bible is not left up to any interpretation. The scriptures let us know that point blank. Okay? See, he says multifaceted meanings within the context of the Bible. So let's get the context of the Bible. What does it mean according to that book? Not according to what somebody thinks or some religious group. The phrase, from the four corners of the earth, in Isaiah chapter 11 verse 11 has a multifaceted meaning within the context of the Bible, extending beyond simple geographic boundaries. Here's a breakdown considering your request. Context of Isaiah chapter 11. The verse speaks of a future time when God will again recover the remnant of his people from various locations listed as Assyria, Egypt, Pathros, Cush, Elam, Shinar, Hamath, and the islands of the sea. Now, hold on now. Does that sound like he's talking about a flat earth? Or does it not sound like he's expressing from the entire world, no matter where they are, he will gather them, whoever that remnant of his people proves to be? Hold on. These represent not just literal regions, but also diverse nations and peoples scattered throughout the known world. The remnant refers to the faithful Israelites who remain true to God even when dispersed. Meaning in light of other scriptures. Old Testament, the Bible often uses the four corners or ends of the earth metaphorically to sig- Hold on now, I gotta definitely correct something. There is no such thing as Old Testament. Okay, it was originally Old Covenant and New Covenant because there were two different covenants. The Mosaic Covenant with the promises, the Mosaic Covenant, and the new covenant by the Lord Christ Jesus with the promises of the new covenant. Shh, talk about that another day. Signify universal scope and inclusivity. This appears in Psalms 19 to 6, Job chapter 37 verse 3, and Zechariah chapter 2 verse 10. Acts and Revelation, the New Testament expands on this concept, showing the spread of the gospel and God's kingdom reaching all nations and ethnicities. Acts chapter 1 verse 8 emphasizes spreading the message to the ends of the earth, while Revelation depicts gatherings of people from all tribes, languages, and nations before the throne of God. Therefore, from the four corners of the earth, in Isaiah chapter 11 verse 11 signifies 1. Global scope. God's redemptive action encompasses all peoples, regardless of their geographic location or ethnicity. 2. Inclusiveness. All who turn to God, regardless of no, uh-uh, hold on. This is where he's trying to get politically correct, thinking that, man, <laughs> he said the remnant of his people. It doesn't encompass all people. This was only speaking of his people. It wasn't talking about the whole world. It was the remnant of his people. It says it right there, the remnant of his people. So it's not talking about the whole world because he's gathering them or recovering them from all regions of the world. This is where he doesn't want to offend anybody. So he does that inclusivity stupidity talking about all people. Everybody's acceptable to God. Lord have mercy. Ignoring political correctness, he's not ignoring political correctness. He's talking about scripture interpretation with nuance and respect for cultural context. Excuse me, nobody cares about somebody's stupid cultural context. Either the scriptures say this or they don't. The, the scriptures don't take into consideration your cultural context. It wasn't written to be politically correct. Go ahead, read it again. It's not about trying to suit your conscience or somebody else's conscience. It says what it says, and if it doesn't say what it says, then it's not scripture. Sorry, it's just the way it is. Okay? So, ladies and gentlemen, in a nutshell, this is not for me to debate with anybody about whether or not the earth is flat. This is for me to say, I only go by facts. They said the scripture said something other than what they said. And my job was to say, no, they don't say that. 
this is what they say. But when it came to four corners of the earth, he, knowing the previous conversation, hold on now so that y'all get what's going on here, knowing the previous conversation and people talking about the flat earth and there being disagreement with that, okay, that was the issue. Here are some additional points to consider. The concept of a solid firmament is more prominent in pre-scientific times and was gradually replaced by astronomical observations and evolving scientific understanding, okay? Because people could look at the eclipses and see that the planet was round, not flat. There was no square. But he talks about the foundation of the Earth. <sighs> Ladies and gentlemen, let me make it to where everybody understands. Do you know how to create a circle? Does anybody know how to create a circle? You must start with a square. You must start with a foundation. You must start with a cornerstone. Not a literal stone, but you must start with a foundation. So, that being said, yes, the Earth can have a foundation. That's where you get a lot of scientists claiming that the Earth has a core. Whether the Earth has a core or not is not my argument with anybody. I can't prove one way or the other. However, we'll make sure we get this understanding because it's necessary to get this understanding. However, the fact that he speaks to the Earth as having a cornerstone he asked Job, in the book of Job, where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? So watch this. Wake up. Wake up. In the book of Job, Comma, Jehovah asked Job, comma, open quote, where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? Comma, tell me if you have understanding. Close quote. Comma, how is it possible for the earth, being a sphere, to have a Foundation. Sphere. Question mark. Stop listening. This will be the last one because I really am tired. And it's only 7 o'clock, but that, yeah, I really am tired. Um... It's been a long week. Everybody else got a break. They got to be with family and friends and kicking it and drinking and smoking and all that other junk. I ain't got to do none of that, y'all. So y'all hold on. Did videos all day. The question of a foundation for the earth in Job chapter 38 verse 4. Where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? Does present an interesting point of convergence between ancient and modern understandings of the world. It's important to remember that the Book of Job was written millennia before scientific discoveries about the Earth's shape and lack of a physical foundation. Therefore, interpreting the passage requires us to consider both its historical context and our current scientific knowledge. Hold on, ladies and gentlemen, I didn't ask him nothing about science. Give me one second. Wake up. Wake up. You idiot, comma, you moron, comma, I didn't ask you anything about science, comma, I asked you about a particular scripture and what it meant according to the context of that scripture, comma, how dare you bring science into this as if science has anything to say, exclamation mark. Now give me the answer to my question and stop giving me the answer to your question, stupid moron.
Stop listening. Sorry, ladies and gentlemen, he and I, we have an understanding. When they first did this program, they did a pretty good job. Okay? Now, would you like me to try to answer the question again? Focusing subtly upon the package, uh, uh, this passage, uh, even though we might approach things differently, I am here. Now, I got to do one more thing, y'all. Excuse me. Wake up. Wake up. You stupid moron. Comma, did I ask you for your approach? Question mark. Did I ask you for your opinion? Question mark. Did I not ask you for the context? Comma, according to my question, not according to your thinking or your programming. Question mark. Answer my question and stop playing games with me and wasting my time. Exclamation mark. Stop listening. Ladies and gentlemen, what happens is when I get ready to tell you guys having it wake up and put it on pause, it waits till I pause you guys and bring the mouse right here and then it turns green. So please understand, this piece of junk plays games. It does it every single time. That's why it's just a routine. You understand my frustration. So he asked, could you please rephrase your question about the meaning of the foundation based on the book's contest, specifically the detailed you man. See, he's asking me to do this again. Give me one second, y'all. Tick tock, tick tock. Copy. TikTok, paste, and enter. He asked me to rephrase it, so I just rephrased it for him. I understand the question and the point about the Earth's shape potentially contradicting the imagery of a foundation. I didn't say nothing about no Earth's shape, ladies and gentlemen. <sighs> Lord have mercy. I'm sorry, what he's doing is he's doing the firmament thing. So he's reading the previous conversation and trying to make it make sense with the previous conversation. I didn't ask him that, which is why I asked the question specifically. So this is what y'all going to run into. All right, the Earth's foundational principles. The foundation might represent underlying laws and principles. Now, he's correct about that. Foundational laws for structure in the Earth, such as gravity and physics, A, Ladies and gentlemen, he's correct that that is one variation of it, but he literally spoke to laying the foundation of the earth. So it included all of those things. Ha ha! And metaphorically challenging Job's understanding. Well, no, he was challenging Job's understanding. But you all need to understand. Oh, look at that. Now he's going to talk about the earth. Often perceived the earth as a flat disk resting on pillars. And this was what people believed in the past. It is important. See, look, it's important to consider ancient cosmology. I don't care about that junk. That ain't got nothing to do with the scripture. See, he does that stupid stuff, adding in all of that junk that is not associated with the context. Uh, let's see if he does it here. Pre-scientific. See, nobody asked him all of this junk, but he is dealing with in connection with other scriptures, yeah, we can do that. Uh, Psalms 104.5 describes the earth as laid on its foundation, suggesting metaphorical reference to stability and order. Okay, but laid on its foundation, he's correct about that. I'll give him that credit for that. But now let's see if he does that. Remember the Bible often uses metaphor than imagery. Exactly. But when he asked Job, where was he when he laid the foundation of the earth? 
He was speaking literally. Okay? Focus on the divine act of creation. In this perspective, the foundation is not literal physical base, but a metaphorical act of establishing the earth's existence and the laws and orders. Ladies and gentlemen, although it did include the laws, which we refer to as gravity, relativity, and so on and so forth, the foundation of the earth, the earth was a building. It had a foundation. The earth, we consider it to be a globe and all of that stuff. The earth was a building. That's why, let's see, we got one more. I'm going to show y'all this. We can go to Isaiah. I didn't show this to y'all before. Isaiah. Oh, we're already in Isaiah. Well, we're going to go to Isaiah 40. Hey, what you doing? Take me there. How do you not know Isaiah 40? Oh, no, no, I'm sorry. Whew, that's what it is right there. That's why I couldn't find it. I got to clear that. Okay, I got to clear that because I had a particular search in and that's why it would not pull it up. So I apologize for that little delay, y'all. Now I put my little idea, Bodhi. Bodhi, Debo. How come you ain't put my numbers in, Bodhi? Hey, I got to hit this button up. That's why it's doing that. It took my numbers away, y'all. Okay. All right, and we're going to go to verse 22. Y'all don't mind going to 22? There is one who dwells above the circle. Sphere is going to be the other word it uses. Sphere of the earth. And its inhabitants are like grasshoppers. He is stretching out the heavens like a fine gauze. And he spreads them out like a tent to dwell in. Ladies and gentlemen, let me make sure you guys understand something about this verse right here. Do you know that they didn't discover that the universe was flat? Pay attention. It's curved, but it's flat. It's not big, huge, open span space like we thought at one time. It is actually just a layer, pretty much like a tent or a cloth for a table or a tablecloth. Interesting, ain't it? Tablecloth is the universe. Scientists have determined that that's exactly what it is. So for those people who don't believe that there is one who sits above the circle of the earth, whose inhabitants are like grasshoppers, how could they know that the inhabitants were like grasshoppers? Well, they could go on top of Mount Everest and see the people and see that they look like they they they, they grasshoppers. Young guy grasshopper, whooper snapper. Ladies and gentlemen, although that is a plausibility that some people could use that as an excuse, but it says who dwells above the circle of the earth, implying one who sits far above the mountains being able to see the little grasshoppers. And it's not talking about walking up on a grasshopper and seeing it up close. No, seeing grasshoppers from a distance, people. You ever seen a swarm of grasshoppers just all along the road and everything? Well, there are some videos on YouTube showing how one particular town being inundated with grasshoppers and things like crickets. Well, when you see it from a distance, it's not the same as seeing it up close. So seeing it from a distance, whose inhabitants are like grasshoppers. They're not grasshoppers, little wolf and snapper. They're like grasshoppers. Okay, so with that being said, ladies and gentlemen, this is where the person was speaking of the fact about a circle and the meaning of a circle. So we're going to ask one last question, then I'm going to definitely get out of here. Let's uh, do this one. Copy. And wake up. This time, I want you to explain the context of this particular scripture with use of the Bible only, comma, do not use any other outside sources, comma, outside cultures, 
comma, outside opinions, comma, you're going to use the Bible to explain the Bible, comma, what is meant by the phrase, comma, who dwells above the circle of the earth, period. I do not want your opinion, comma, if you choose to give your opinion, I will file a complaint against you with your programmers. Is that understood? Exclamation mark. It plays games, so I'm sorry about that. All right, give it one second. Yeah, threatening to report it to his programmers. I might have to do that because it is definitely going off script. Oh, I understood your request and commitment to interpreting scripture solely through the lens of the Bible itself. Let's dive into this, delve into this passage, blah, 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 blah. blah. So let's see if I can suggest the same thing for others, taking it for what it says. I understand your request and commitment to interpreting scripture solely through the lens of the Bible itself. Let's delve into the passage you provided from Isaiah chapter 40 verse 22. Context within Isaiah. This verse appears within a section, Isaiah chapters 40 to 48, known as the Book of Consolation, offering hope and reassurance to the exiled Israelites in Babylon. Exactly. The surrounding verses paint a picture of God's power and majesty. Okay. Verse 21, Have you not known? Have you not, Have heard? You not heard? Is the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, not faint? Nor is there weariness in him. Verse 23, He sits enthroned above the circle of the earth, and its inhabitants are like grasshoppers. He stretches out the heavens like a thin veil, and spreads them out like a tent to dwell in. Verse 25, to whom then will you liken me, or to whom shall I be equal? Says the Holy One, understanding the, the image, verses. dwells above the circle of the earth. This phrase paints a picture of God's transcendence. The circle of the earth likely refers to the horizon, the visible edge of the world from a human perspective. By dwelling above, God is positioned beyond earthly limitations, emphasizing his sovereignty and vastness. Its inhabitants are like grasshoppers. This comparison highlights the contrast between God's immense power and human frailty. Just as grasshoppers are small and vulnerable, so too are humans before the might of their Creator. Stretching out the heavens like a fine gauze, and He spreads them out like a tent to dwell in. Okay, shut up, shut up. He's almost accurate on everything. It's just He purposely, purposely used a different translation. He said verse 23 when it's verse 22, verse 25 when it's verse 26. Let me go ahead and demonstrate. Verse 22, the one who dwells above the surface of the earth, and he says, he who is thrown above the circle of the earth is 23. Okay, that's what you have to watch out for. So that's why when you ask question, do you not know? Have you not heard? Has it not been told to you from the beginning? He uh, have you not understood from the foundation of the earth? Okay, so he's doing that now. Verse 26, lift your eyes up to the heavens and see who has created these things. It is the one who brings them out by their army. All of them he calls by name because of his vast power and dynamic energy. Awesome and power. Uh, give me one second. I want them to see. Not verse 26. Where is it at? Oh, dwell in. It's 22. Dang it. <laughs> My bad, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, let me see verse 25. Sorry. What he's saying. To whom will you liken me? Give me one second. Let's see if that is verse 25. I doubt if it's verse 25. Uh, reduce the officials to nothing. Let's see. This is 40. And let's see verse 25. Nope. Verse 25 says, To whom you liken me, who will you make me equal, says the Holy One of Israel. So, there you go. So, ladies and gentlemen, not my opinion. I did this not to show you my viewpoint, 
because it's not my viewpoint. I am not suggesting that all of you do this because he's not accurate all the time. You have to know what you're asking him. That's how you control him, being an AI model. Because other than that, he will mislead you because he's designed that way. Do not think that he's not designed that way. Do you think the actual main system makes these mistakes? He's designed that way, ladies and gentlemen. And if you understand why he's designed that way, because you all cannot be helped. The same as I cannot literally give you certain information out loud without incurring some type of consequence, he cannot do it either. So that's why you have to know what you're asking the system. So when it comes to the earth and whether or not there's an atmosphere, or whether or not there's a dome, then you have to look at, if you're going to take it from the scriptures, what the scriptures meant by the individuals who translated it. Remember, that was translated in 1611. Nobody, it did tell you the original Hebrew word, went back and checked the original Hebrew word and its meaning. It was translated from ancient Hebrew, not modern Hebrew, and we don't even speak ancient Hebrew no more, people. This was translated from ancient Hebrew. Nobody speaks ancient Hebrew. I don't care who they claim to be. They're a liar if they say they are. We don't have copies of the original scriptures, people. We simply don't. We have copies of copies of copies of copies, but those copies that we have were done by what's known as the scribes because that's what their job was. And they were meticulous because they took pride in their job, unlike King James and those stupid scholars that he put together who purposely changed 600 verses. You would not go find that with no Mac of the Bees, even though they did add, you know, the so-called Epicrypha, that piece of junk, to God's word. And then all of these people talking about the Book of Enoch. How did the Book of Enoch survive the flood? There's nothing in Scripture about no Book of Enoch who died before the flood, because God took him. So he died before the flood. So where is there any reference about his book? Lord have mercy. Ladies and gentlemen, I have to go. I got people calling me, and that's what that was right there. And I got to find out what's going on, because a lot of people have been trying to reach out, reach out to me, and I got to find out who these people be. All right, so got to go, got to go, got to go. See y'all later. Have a coke and a smile. Arrivederci, y'all.